Technology Laboratories here. Um, we've been gone for a couple of days because we get reloaded. Well, uh, Sweet Maria's finally came through. Well, and UPS finally scored through, and we've gotten some new beans to roast. Um, so we're going to have a lot of options that we're going to be roasting over the next couple of days as we are fully stocked. Just to give you a look at what we got going on here. As I said, we the hopper is completely shucked full. Good stuff here. We got eight pounds of different varieties. Uh, I just ordered a random pack from Sweet Maria's. Just ask them to give me whatever um, whatever they had. Uh, you can order just random. You can order four pound randoms, eight pound randoms. And then I uh, went ahead and got myself a five pound bag of an Ethiopian dry process. And I'll be uh, roasting this about intermittently. Um, this will be what I'm trying to really perfect uh, my roast on. The new eight pounders, uh, those are all just going to be kind of discovering new tastes from many of the different varieties. Uh, along with the different regions, there are several different processes. Uh, we haven't talked about what a process is, um, but when the drying, so when the beans uh, are harvested, uh, there's many ways they can process them. They will lay them out thin in a layer. They don't want them to stack uh, because what they're really trying to prevent is fermentation or fermentation happening too quick or even worse, mold or rot. Uh, but depending on what the grower is trying to do, they will, uh, they're going to have different processes. The oldest type of processing would be called dry processing. And that's just what it sounds like. They lay all the cherries out. They let the fruit kind of, decompose off the beans and they scoop up the beans and that's what you get. Your Ethiopians, your Kenyans, your African coffees, a lot of them you're going to get that dry process. Now, dry process isn't as effective. Uh, it's more effective in Central, Amer Central and South America. There you're going to see a process called wet processing. And that is where they actually wash all of the fruit off the beans and then they dry the beans. Uh, this prevents things like mold, fermentation, uh, a lot of the negative stuff that can ruin a batch of coffee. So if the dry process isn't done right, it can ruin really, really good coffee. Uh, recently, well, I don't want to say recently, but uh, what we're beginning to see in countries like um, Sumatra, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Colombia, in uh, other part, in Central American countries, they're starting to do this process called honey. Now, honey is when they will leave not all the fruit on, but they'll actually just wash off a percentage. Uh, so that could be 20%, it could be 50%. Uh, this is going to give it that flavor that uh, kind of the dry process, but it gives the, uh, the farmer a little bit more control over fermentation and rot. So they're not just hoping that they get the right conditions. They're just going to wash it and leave just enough on. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. This is a Sumatran. Um, and as I alluded to, let you kind of, I'll just hold this up. This kind of just gives you a brief, uh, understanding of the notes and just, uh, to know these notes, this is what we call a hybrid process. It's a honey wet hauled, meaning they left some of it on there. And if you look, you can actually see some of the coffee cherry dust is in this bag and the beans are quite a bit, uh, darker. They are a little bit less washed. They're quite a bit darker than your washed beans. So we have a pound of this. Uh, I've never done a Sumatran before, so I'm kind of excited uh, just to open that up and take a look at it. Uh, it's got some interesting flavors that I'm looking ex exploring. Uh, they're pretty pungent, so you should be able to catch onto these, some of these flavors when drinking them. Um, again, flavors of raisin, stewed plums, so kind of that. Those kind of are in the same flavor uh, junction. Pipe tobacco, I'm curious to be what that, that's going to taste like. I bet that's uh, close to that plum taste. Uh, fruits like papaya, jackfruit, mild earth tones, and cocoa nib in the aftertaste. So what this tells to me is that I'm going to want to go a little bit darker than that city roast that I've been doing with the Kenyan and Ethiopian. So I'm going to use this pound to kind of play around and see if I can uh, take this to a little bit darker than what I've been taking because some of these notes, especially that cocoa nib aftertaste, uh, that is going to kind of allude itself to a little bit of that darker. So we're going to move past the city 
into that city plus full city range. And that's just a little bit darker. Uh, if you're wondering like, what is the city city plus? That's more of a roasting term terminology, but what you need to, what you need to kind of set your mind to is that this is going to be in that medium roast. We're going to try to go to that medium roast. Uh, we're going to take a little bit past first crack. And when I say a little bit past, I mean only 15, 20 seconds after I stop here and cracking, I'm going to let the heat go a little more and I'm going to cut it out. Uh, but that's going to give me that little bit darker, um, which should bring out some of the more chocolatey notes and really maybe bring out uh, whatever is bringing, whatever this quoted plums, pipe tobacco and papaya taste. So I'm kind of interested to see how this goes. So as I, as I said before, it is a wet uh, hybrid process, meaning they actually left a little bit of the coffee cherry on it when drying. And you can see that in this bag, you can actually see some of the coffee cherry still sticking on to the beans, which I'm excited. Like I said, I've not done Sumatra before. Now, when doing something new, it's very important to take close notes. I only have a pound of this and I'm gonna cut it in half. I'm gonna do a half a pound and then another half a pound. Uh, so it's really gonna be important that I'm taking good notes uh, because the second that if I really get something that I like, I wanna have good notes. And if I get something that I hate, I want to be able to throw that out and just get rid of it altogether uh, and try something new. Uh, but it should go um, about what I'm thinking. Well, like I said, I don't know much about Sumatrans. So really, this is going to be trial by error. So, But if I do even get a remote taste, I will buy that uh, five pound bag. So those of you just joining us, you can see I'm fully stocked now. Sweet Maria's is hooked. Well, I bought it, so they didn't really give it to me, but uh, I have purchased a litany of things to experiment on. So we should be getting a lot of cool roasts over the next couple of days. So let's go ahead and stop, tar stop talking, start roasting. So I'm gonna warm up my machine. I'm gonna take my weight measurement uh, and get going here. Uh, any, as always, any questions that pop up, I'm going to try to be active in the chat because that is why I'm doing this whole Twitch uh, game is to kind of create that interactive piece. So if you have questions while I'm roasting, feel free to ask. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be trying to take some pretty careful notes um, when smells are coming in, when certain colors are starting to happen, um, when that, you know, all those changes that I've talked about previously, and I'll just, I'll rediscuss them as we get to them. Uh, but since this is new, uh, it's kind of like I'm in a totally new territory. Now, I know this machine pretty well, uh, being that this is the 61st roast. So I kind of know what, I kind of think I know what's going like to expect, but I'm going to be keeping a close eye and a close ear and a close nose to really make sure I'm following uh, correctly on all of this. So let's, uh, I'm just going to do a half pound like I have been doing. Uh, that's around about 230 grams. Give or take, and there's 228, so in the grand world. So we'll take our other half. Um, I will put a full description of this in the video as well, uh, just kind of what it is that I'm doing. But this is just for austerity sakes. So we're a little bit off. Got yeah, a little bit uh, overzealous there with my weighing. Good to, like I said, it's good to just check, get everything kind of figured out, squared away before you get going with something new. And perfect reason why to uh, do these test runs first. That just kicked my power out. So that's kind of embarrassing. I'm going to go set everything, get the power going back. Um, I'll kind of explain why that happened here in a minute, uh, but uh, I'm gonna go turn the power back on, right back. Gives me a good chance to try out my 
full screen. All right, well, that's why you uh, always want to test everything out and why the preheating works so well. So like I said, two and a half pound. So just for keep everything kind of the same ballpark. There we go. So kind of just show you the more personal element of home roasting. Uh, I'm roasting in my house, so you know we got I got other people living in here. So for comfort's sake, we had a space heater that I happen to set my electricity up to um, when this room that I'm in was uh, pretty much just a old, I don't want to call it a bomb shelter, but it's dug pretty deep into the basement. Um, I added the power. I tapped into a plug that when I mapped it all out, it had nothing running to it, uh, but it became winter and we added a space heater and that space heater happens to be on that plug. Now it's not a big deal because most of the year we don't run that space heater but it's uh, pretty nasty weather out here today so we had the space heater on competing with the roaster and i just forgot to turn the space heater off and it blew the power because this actually draws a pretty significant amount of power so we have it set here um we got it preheated to a little bit above 200 degrees now um and it's all ready to go now when it's on a circuit by itself, I mean, that is the limitation of a electric roaster that you're not gonna run into with gas. Like gas is supplied more like water and electricity ha you know, is also coming like water, but it's going to have overload protections. Um, when you're roasting on an electric machine, especially the Beemore, uh, the problem is, is your power that's supplied to you will actually affect the roast. So if you take this and you plug this machine in somewhere else, like you may have different results because you might be getting more power. It just depends on how much power is being drawn. In fact, the time of day on wh in which you are uh, roasting will also play a role. So in the summer, at night, more power is being drawn uh, than say in the morning, early in the morning. So you actually have longer roast times at night than you would in the morning. So electricity is, it's great because it's clean. It's easy to supply. I mean, it's great for a home roaster, but when you start getting into the fundamentals of roasting, like all these little, these little numbers start to matter, especially when you create something that you really, really enjoy and you want to recreate it. It's, you have to start looking for every little niche. And that's like when coffee roasting really becomes the art form. Um, much more than just, hey, I'm going to roast coffee. Um, yes, there is a science behind coffee. And if you follow the science, you will get close. But it's about learning your machine, learning your beans, learning your product, learning your setup, learning where you're at, learning your customers. So it's an art. It has a lot of, a lot of room for expression where it's you're kind of painting 
with a really creative median and the, all, the ultimate product is going to be taste. So uh, that is just one of the quirks that you, are, that you have to deal with uh, when roasting coffee. Um, so that is that. So in the log, this is roast number 61. Uh, all that means is this is the 61st roast I've done on this machine. Most of them in half pound roasts. Uh, and I started back in August. So that is when I'm writing this down. I also like to keep the list of characteristics about what it is. So this is a Sumatran. I also put the region. So this is Terracini. And I'm also going to put that it's hybrid. I put that it's a half pound. I preheated it to 200. I got the roaster set, drum roast set at plus, and um, I'm using what's called manual mode, meaning a manual full power. And I take these notes every time I roast. Uh, just, again, in case, let's say I love this, and I come back and I order this, and three weeks later I have a five pound bag of this, at least I have some rudimentary notes uh, that kind of can help guide me where I'm going. So, we should be right on track after our little hiccup with the power, which is, it's honestly not the first time that's happened. It happens, uh, especially now that it's winter. Um, as the temperature changes, so too does your roasting. That's why you just gotta be ready for everything. Um, this, again, I'm just checking very, these numbers aren't, they're, in the roasting world, they're nothing. Uh, hopefully someday I'll be able to show you guys a uh, more of a conventional like what you would see out of a commercial roast um, there are smaller machines that you can kind of mimic commercial roasting a lot better so hopefully I will be able to show you that that's when I can get computer software we can start logging profiles we can really start playing around uh, but right now I'm just trying to keep the data that I can keep and as I've said many, many times before, data is the name of the game um, when it comes to this. And that's how, you, that's how I plan to really continue to grow uh, in this art or in this craft, is I'm just going to, I'm gonna roast a lot. I'm gonna do a lot of different things. I'm gonna experiment when I want, when I have, you know, when I get questions. I'm going to hold fast when I get something that I like, because more importantly than anything, that's what this is all about, like any art. If you like it, it's good. Like, and I think that is uh, the one thing that this has really shown me is that it's not really so much about trying to make everybody happy because coffee is one of those things that it has its cultural elements, its ritualistic elements. It's just what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to make something that tastes good to me. And also I'm going to take notes from other people who are drinking because sometimes you get so stuck on thinking something tastes good. Someone gives you a note and all of a sudden, boom, something tastes different or something is different. So, uh, got a good question about the length. Uh, winter, really it's not so much longer, it's the, it's the preparation. So I will preheat the machine. It takes longer to preheat the machine because this thing is starting at a temperature about 50 degrees down here. Um, I don't really have the heat on down here, so it does take a little bit longer. The roasting time has been stretched out at a, to about 45 seconds longer than roasts I did on same beans in the summer. Uh, so not significant as long as I'm willing to charge it up. Uh, if I were to throw this thing in cold, it'd probably add three, four minutes uh, just because uh, starting it from 80 degrees and 50 degrees, that 30 degrees, it only it creates heat about 15 degrees every minute. So that's a good question from the chat there. So about after we're about five minutes in, we're approaching 300. So this is... Scaling uh, very familiar to the other coffee I've had. I can tell you that the smell is a little bit different. Um, that, that wet process that I talked about a little bit earlier, you can definitely tell the, the sugars um, that are present on the outside of the beans. It, it's uh, smoking up a little bit. Uh, so along with that grassy, that kind of uh, brown rice smell, I'm also getting a little bit of... Uh, Kind of a char, not charred, burnt, but sugar, but I can definitely sense a lot more sugars in this wet process. So I'm very curious to see 
the overall result on that. So, 305. We are, it is going a little bit faster, which I have, like I said, I haven't done a lot of research on Sumatras. I haven't done them before, but what I'm starting to get just by the uh, different temperatures that I'm reading, um, it could be the case that I'm just looking here and we are yellowing, browning a little bit faster than normal. My guess is, is that these might be a little bit less dense than some of the beans that I've done. Um, which is causing it to heat up a little bit faster. And I'll explain that at the end. So, so we're ramping up pretty quick, so I'm gonna need to watch it kind of closely to make sure it doesn't uh, start tripping in uh, some autocorrects that I don't want the machine to do. So if you see me really starting to pester this button, it's because I'm trying to get a read on if I should cut the power so it doesn't reach uh, the, the machine's maximum capabilities. So I'm at 320. That's as high as I want to get ever. So I did cut the power a little bit. I'm gonna let it come down just a just a minor amount. I'm gonna let it come down about four degrees, and then I will let it. I'll pick it back up to full power, which I just did. So do you have beans come to room temperature before roasting, or are those stored in a in a fridge? Uh, the beans are just roasted at room at room temperature. Now 70 degrees would be desirable, but Room temperature here is 50. So uh, I just store them in a cool, dry place. Now, basement's not the driest, but this, this the humidity in here is not bad. Um, I keep it in a plastic container just in case there is some outside humidity. Uh, and it's also in a plastic bag. So those things are kind of way in. So eight minutes in, we're right, we're riding right at 320. We're right where we need to be, and the beans are starting to brown up. I'm predicting that we should be seeing first crack in about a minute, minute and a half. So we'll be watching. Um, I'll start watching to see what the external temperature is. That's just the uh, what's coming out here. Um, and hopefully I can get a good read on when this thing is going to enter first crack. As I mentioned at the start of the video, we're going to be taking a little bit darker than we have uh, because of the variety and the kind of flavors that we're getting. There is a chocolatey note that this is, bean is known for. In order to get that, chocolate is created with a bitter taste. So we have to go a little bit longer to allow the beans to bitter up to let that chocolate come out. Um, if we do this right, it could taste a little bit like chocolate covered raisins, a little bit of that pipe tobacco, um, not like smoked tobacco, but like uh, that really rich, robust, kind of raisiny, kind of plummy taste. So that's, what, that's what we desire on this roast. And the smell is, it's a, uh, very intoxicating. I mean, I, I'm, this is a very, probably the most rich smell of any roast I've done so far. So I'm kind of excited about that. The external temperature is a little bit lower, meaning the beans, the, the, what it's pumping out is a little bit lower than the Kenyan that we've been doing. That's interesting. I'm gonna do, I'll do a little bit of research about Sumatran. Uh, hopefully the next time I roast, I can give you guys a little bit more insight about what I'm seeing from my Sumatra roast. Um, I, do, I am hearing some cracks, so I'm gonna start keeping a very close eye. I'm at about 347, but inside the machine, it's, they're, they're brown and it looks like they're gonna be going soon. So I'm gonna quiet down and just listen. So I'm slowing the drum down, getting cracks. And the cracks are picking up sound. I'm gonna wait till the la I hear the last crack and I'm gonna let it go about 10 seconds, that's it. And I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna try to drop it into its cooling really allow this thing to go just a little bit darker. So I'm just gonna let it go 10 seconds now. It's hard, I mean, it's hard for me to not push the cooling. I really want to. And there we go. I, I'm gonna admit, like I know it sounds silly, but I really just wanted to push that cooling because I'm so, so used to taking this thing to that city 
roast that I've been doing, but I want to try to go a little darker. Um, and let's see, so I'm gonna let this go for 30 seconds. Just let the machine kind of just calm down just a bit. Let all the beans settle down. And then now, here we go. This back in here. It's cool. And I'm going to drop this in my external temperature. But you can see we've got a lot of smoke pouring off this thing right now. Kind of a cool shot. Let you guys kind of dive your little heads in here. Ooh, look, that looks good. That's real even. I'm excited about what is going on here. It smells good. The chaff is definitely more burnt. So that coffee berry that was sticking on it definitely burnt up a little bit. I wonder if that's going to affect the flavor. So I'm curious to see what that means when I put it uh, into the old, and get into the old cup. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a couple of things here. So, like I said, I did take a little bit darker. So, I generally like to roast my beans a couple of different ways. I like I like I'll do a drip, especially now I'm on vacation. Uh, I, two people drip. I'll do a drip because. I'm an, what can I say, I'm an American, I like drip coffee. I don't like it, I like the convenience of it. I do like it, like it's fine. Like I know it's, you know, if you got to the coffee purists, they would look at drip coffee and say, you know, all you're doing is over extracting, uh, you're over cooking and then you're over watering. Uh, but you know what, like I said, coffee isn't necessarily about the science, it's culture, it's routine, it's ease, it's convenience and I get, good drip coffee. I mean, it's better drip coffee than I ever got from a, a roaster or a coffee house. So it's not like I'm drinking inferior drip coffee. I'm drinking the best drip coffee I ever had. Now, is it the best coffee I ever had? No, not by a long shot. There are so many other preparations that are going to create better coffee. For me, uh, pour over done right by someone who knows what they're doing is it's fantastic. Like it converts the hard to be converters. Uh, pour over is, it's the Cadillac. But I've stumbled on a little machine called the AeroPress. Um, I'm going, that's probably going to be the first kitchen video that I do is I'm going to show you the AeroPress because the AeroPress is awesome. It's not an espresso and it's not French press. It's a hybrid between the both. It cuts out the bitterness that French press has. It cuts out the expense and the time that espresso has. And it's just, it's awesome. So if you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't want to do K-Cups anymore. I don't want to drink out of the stale pot. I want to start roasting my own cup of coffee at work when I travel anywhere. The AeroPress is legit. Like, and that is the first thing I'm going to show because anytime, like that is my go-to. I know I'm getting solid coffee out of an AeroPress no matter where I'm at. I freaking love the AeroPress. Um, and you can put anything through it. It's such a forgiving method and you're always going to get great coffee in it. And it's not that hard to learn. And it has like a thousand recipes. So depending on where I take this, I might just do AeroPress. Like every now and then I'll just show you a different AeroPress. So we'll look at the 2019 World Championships and we might just do every single recipe and I'll just give you my notes and drink the coffee and I'll be happy and you guys can cook alongside me if you want to and just, we can just enjoy that. But that's the AeroPress. But I did take this thing a little darker. So now it kind of tells me, hey, what kind of darker roasting techniques? Well, we could do a French press, but that's too bitter. Uh, so there's another thing that I'm going to try that is better for espresso blends that's not espresso. And I'm going to be showing that. Um, I probably won't do a kitchen review on that because I'm brand new to it. It's called a mocha pot, and I've done it a couple of times. It's pretty cool. Uh, the roasting style that I've done prior, not great for it, but I'm kind of excited to put this thing through the mocha pot. Um, also I will put, it's going to be posted in my bio, but follow my Instagram because that's where I'm posting every time I roast something, I'm posting the roast number. So the batch that I roasted it in, and then I'm roasting what I think I'm getting good taste from. 
Uh, so that is going to be a new element that every time I roast on the Twitch, I'm going to accompany it by showing you the roasting techniques that I'm doing with that batch. So that if you're wondering like, hey, what should I do for a light roast? Or I just picked up some a good light roast from a coffee shop. How should I make it at home? I'm going to let you guys kind of see the techniques that I'm using. And they'll all be from home um, because that's really what I cater to. I'm a, I'm a home roaster and I'm a home drinker. And I want to try to get the best cup here in my house. And it's not that hard to do. Um, you don't have to be a trained barista and make good coffee. That's the bottom line. Uh, anyway, I'm going to be doing that. And then as we adapt the kitchen, I'll start doing Twitch streams, which I think will be kind of cool because I'm going to be able to do the roast, cook the coffee, or brew the coffee, and then drink the coffee all in a continuous like episode to episode to episode. Or maybe I might even just, you know, if I got some time, I might roast, then go to the kitchen, brew, then drink, and that's where I'll talk, kind of just talk a little bit about this, or really anything. Like, the chat can go anywhere it wants to. That's kind of the cool thing about Twitch is that, I mean, if you've got any questions, I'm always willing to BS my way through anything. So uh, that is going to be that as well. Uh, anything else I'm thinking about right now is my mind is just thinking about this, how excited I am to drink this new coffee. Anything in the chat uh, that you got, let me know. I'm going to go turn the vacuum off. Uh, I know that's been really annoying. I guess it doesn't really hit the mic very well, so that's good. That's good to know. There it is. Room temp. A little lighter. Not quite the City Plus, so... Got, still got a little too quick, uh, quick triggered. So next time I'm gonna try to go a little darker. Yes, um, I did just eat a raw bean. No, there is no rhyme or reason for that. There is a technique called audacity. Hmm. We'll see. Um, audacity is not a bad thing, but we're, I'm interested to see the. How this comes around. It's got some bite to it. Uh, anyway, we'll put this through. I'll give some notes, and that's going to kind of lead me to where I'm going to go. Here. Let's give you a look. I mean, it looks good. It's even. Got that. Got all the characteristics. Um, now, Another thing I'm going to be doing and I'm learning about, and if anybody wants to post anything in the comments, in the chat, on Instagram, anything, I'm going to start a technique called um, cupping. No, I don't know how that sounds, but uh, what cupping is, is it's actually how roasters try to determine their what they did. It started out by trying to determine the bean quality, but... A good roaster can tell, can kind of give you an idea of if their profile is right by essentially grinding up the coffee, putting it in water, and then slurping it and tasting the flavors. Um, you really can get the flavors to expose themselves easily by this method. Um, get some grounds in your mouth, but it is a very quick way. So another thing I'm going to start doing, and once I learn, is I'm going to start cupping my own coffee because... My overall goal is just to take this art as far as I can go. Like, how great of a cup of coffee can I make in my house? That's kind of the uh, the long journey I'm on. Is hopefully over, always moving towards uh, betterment. Maybe not always, but uh, that's also the goal. Um, so, I'm gonna load this thing into the rum rumski here. Rumaroo. Give her a shake, and then I think that's all I got. That's all I got to say about that. I am on Twitter, and in fact, Twitter probably is the best integration to Twitch. Um, if you have any preferences, since... 
you small group, you small happy few are my people. If you prefer one to the other, let me know. Um, I am on Instagram, again, uh, at Fat Beans Coffee Labs. Uh, Instagram, I will post that in the, the Twitch bio as well. And I'll post all of my socials together so that you can, there can be some sort of web. What we're really doing right now is we're just throwing everything at the wall and seeing if there is any sort of interest at all. And honestly, don't really care if there's a ton of interest or not, because I enjoy doing this. I really enjoyed this element. Uh, I like the accountability it has for me. It, it kind of forces my hand to roast when I don't want to. It also kind of gets me thinking about things um, just by saying them and putting them out there. So, But if there is an interest, might as well peek what we can find. So, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, let me see. Pretty good copy. All right, well, you guys got nothing else. I don't want to uh, appreciate, again, the people who are in, uh, propping up my ego here while I do this. Um, any questions? Drop them in anything you'd like. And thank you, Julie, for that uh, little chat drop there. Um, yeah, like I said, early on, I'm all ears for any thoughts, comments, or ideas because I'm just having fun just exploring this element of it. And I just feel like uh, this is the engine that is going to continue to push this thing down the track. So uh, thanks for being here with me tonight. And I will see you guys next time when we do the other half of this. Uh, and I will hopefully have some good news to share with you on this one. As always, bye.